Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Good to be here with you. Um, let me just pause and pray really quickly with you. Father in heaven, thank you so much that you are with us. We just pray that you'll be seen, heard, and felt today. In your name, amen. So we're in the middle of a series called Life on the Edge. Been sharing stories of rock climbing and adventure and heraldry and I just uh, wore my rock climbing belt today so I could be extra in tune. In case I need it, I can just, you know, clip onto the, uh, the anchor or something. No. Um, okay. Now, the biblical worldview. We are living in a world that God created and made. When God made it, it was good, good, good. Very good. And um, that world was the world that God gave to us and we took it and we decided to misuse our freedom. And with the misuse of our freedom, this world was plunged into sin and to decay and to the hurt and to all the other things that we dislike that we have with us today. As soon as that happened, um, God stepped in and he made a promise. Made a promise that he would take care of this problem, that he would heal the sin and he would um, bring salvation to us. And he said that he would um, take upon himself the worst of the problem. This he did in the life of Jesus, where Jesus came and he lived the life that we should have lived. He died the death that we deserve so we could live the life he deserved. And um, now through a faith in that, we have that salvation. And on Jesus' departure, he left us with an extraordinary command found in Matthew 28. He says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. So Jesus comes. He pays the price for our sin. And he asks us now to join with him in the redemption of humanity. And he commits to us this monstrous task of telling the rest of the world what he has done for them. I don't know if you ever thought about that, but it's kind of daunting, isn't it? It's a big task. I mean, I know that I know that God promises the gift of evangelism to some of the people in the church, but that's that's not me. That's just for some of the others. And, I mean, why would God even pick humans to, to perform this, like, most important task? I mean, we fail, we mess up, we let him down. Like, why us? Doesn't he have just 10,000 times 10,000 angels at his command that do the job perfectly every time? This is the point in the sermon where I know that you're just waiting for a rock climbing story. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint. Uh, there are some other extreme sports though, and from one of these we will draw. I of course am talking about the extreme sport of birding. Now, I started birding in 2014. Brian Simmons got me into it. And um, when I started to get excited about it, 
I, you know, I, I had a certain budget I could spend on my binoculars and, oh, by the way, just a, twi uh, a quick tip. If you want to be in the in crowd, you don't call it bird watching, it's birding, okay? So, so just remember, we go birding, we don't, we don't, bird watching is like what old ladies do. <laughs> this is birding. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with old ladies. <laughs> I didn't, no oh dear. Well, I'll give you another tip. <laughs> Maybe I better not. So I went to buy my binoculars. This is where the other tip was going to come in. We call them bins, okay? So we go birding with my bins. It's the lingo. And I had a budget I could spend. I wanted to get the best pair that fit in that price range. And uh, so I went at it very scientifically. I, I read, I made a, a big old spreadsheet of all of them that fit. And I decided, I narrowed it down to 10 and um, bought all 10 of them. And I bought them from places where I could return them. So I bought them so I could test them out and see which one I liked best. Settled on a pair. And I started birding. And my, not, not everybody, not all of my family and friends were as excited about it as I was. Some of them thought it was kind of silly. I remember when I showed up with a bag of binoculars and I was looking at every bird that flew by and my older brother was kind of laughing at me like, you're into that, that's a sissy thing. And, I, and it wasn't long, I kid you not, before he's picking up a pair of binoculars and he's looking at this bird and he's like, oh, this thing's awesome. And he's asking me about it and, and anyways, I thought, how cool. He's like picking it up. And I had this, this friend, his, uh, he was one of my youth kids when I was in Fresno, his name is Jason. He, uh, he was, he's like a big tough guy, right? But we were hanging out for the weekend, and it wasn't long before all of a sudden he's like flipping through my bird book, my field guide. He's trying to identify the birds that were there. And even my younger brother, Matthew, he was a harder sell. He's like, what's Tom getting into birds for? Not too long ago, my mom asked him what he was doing, and he was like, oh, I was just looking at some birds. And she's like, ah, yeah, sure, kind of thinking he's joking. He's like, no, really, I mean, I think it's pretty cool that Tom, Tom's into birding. So I learned something really interesting through birding. And that is that when we are excited about something, we talk about it. And then when we talk about something with enthusiasm, it's contagious to those who are around us at least enough that they're willing to give it a try. So because I'm super excited about birding and I'm, you know, identifying everything I can get my eye on, um, some people think it's kind of silly at first, but, but, you know, they start looking at birds and they're starting to see the details and, and they see the glory in it and, and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, this is cool, I could, I could do this, I could get into this too. So I'm basically a birding evangelist. <laughs> and I think that just illustrates a really important lesson for us about evangelism, about sharing, right? Like, it's not that we, ha we don't have to be a Billy Graham and, and preach in front of thousands of people to be an evangelist. But just like when I'm birding here, I'm telling my friends about something that I like and they're getting excited about it too. Now I got some pictures for you because birds are really cool, by the way. 
This, I know it's not a great picture. Um, I, most of these pictures I took with my iPhone through my scope, so um, they are what they are. But you can kind of see it there. It's uh, orange, it's black, it's a really pretty bird. Anybody know what this is? It's a, it's a varied thrush. Anybody seen one of these? Couple of you. Did you know that we have these in Tuolumne County? Your world just got bigger. <laughs> See, God created so many amazing things you don't even know about. When I started birding, my world, my, my view of God, it just expanded like none other. Um, this is called a yellow-breasted chat. Um, pretty cool little bird. It's got a cool song. Um, this is not a very great picture. I wish you could, you'll have to look this up. It's called a common kingfisher. Um, the whole back is this really incredible iridescent blue. Um, well, look at the bill on that thing. That's why I threw this one in. Look at that bill. Uh, I took this picture uh, near the Sea of Galilee. So this is a bird that Jesus saw. See, I went on this trip last summer with all, a whole bunch of uh, pastors to Israel, and um, I was trying to see every bird I could while I was over there. And uh, some of them were laughing at me, but hey, I, I got to see a lot more of Israel than they did. Um, got a, a canyon wren for you. This is probably one of my favorite um, songs. This is from the canyon wren. Um, they're also uh, all around here. This is a cool bird. It's called a hoopé. See that head? Um, this was also at the Sea of Galilee. Um, and I got a video of a barred owl. I took this in... Um, near Chicago and uh, it's again my iPhone pretty cool owl I don't know if you could tell but it was snowing there the reason it wasn't very clear is because my my lens was starting to fog up a little bit um, the temperature was like 15 degrees so who says birding's not extreme All right, have I made any birders this morning? Can I get a witness? <laughs> okay. So I learned a really important lesson, and that is when we are excited about something, we talk about it. And when we talk about something we're excited about, it's contagious, and people who are around us get excited about it too, or at the very least are willing to give it a try. And I think that is something that we see mirrored most of the time in the Bible when, when people are sharing their faith with others. So um, we're going to look at a, three different stories here in John chapter 1. Um, this first one is about John the Baptist. It says, The next day he, that is John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And, and John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He to whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Okay, what is John doing here? Well, John has had an experience with God. God told him, the one whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on, that is the Son of God, the Messiah. And so John is there baptizing people and someone comes from the crowd that catches his eye and this is Jesus. Jesus comes and asks to be baptized and John baptizes him. And when he does, uh, a, a, a dove, which is the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove, comes down and lands on Jesus. And John hears God's voice say, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. 
This is John's experience. And so um, later when John is talking to his disciples, he is able to point Jesus out and he says, Behold, this is the Lamb of God. He is the Messiah. Uh, he's the one God told me is coming for this, to save this world. And I think it's really interesting what John doesn't say any more than his experience. He doesn't have uh, an amazing sermon, a theological debate on the Messiah, on his coming, on anything. He just gives his experience. What he experienced with God, that is what he shares. Do you see that? So now we're going to look at a story with Andrew. Andrew is a cool character because, because every time he shows up, in the Bible, he is bringing people to Jesus. So the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus, and as he walked, he said again, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following, and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, Where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. So they came and they saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. So Andrew, going about his day, John points out, that's the Messiah there. He's curious, and he goes and checks it out. He hangs out with Jesus for the whole day. And afterwards, the first thing he does is he goes to his brother, and he's like, we've found the Messiah, and he brings him to him. I think it's so simple. It's so simple what he does. Uh, he doesn't have, uh, you know, a, a big, long argument all he does is has an experience with Jesus and then he invites somebody else to come and see this person that uh, come and see this person that has made a difference in his life. Isn't that pretty neat? We have one more story here. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom the Messiah, Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. I don't know about you, but if it worked like it did with John the Baptist and with Andrew every time, it probably wouldn't be that intimidating to, to share with people my faith. I mean, if every time I just invited somebody, they came, and no questions asked, it would, it would be easy, wouldn't it? But I think the scary part of it is when people start hitting us with questions or start, you know, what about this, what about that? And I love the way that Philip... Uh, fields Nathaniel's um, criticisms and comments. Does he get into a theological debate with him? Does he? No. Does he? He doesn't even start to try and prove either how Jesus was, you know, from Bethlehem, or he doesn't try and uh, uh, convince him of anything. What does he do? Come and see. He invites him to just try for himself, come and see. This is, this is a lot like, this is a lot like the language that is used in Psalm 34, where David writes, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. God is inviting God is inviting us into a relationship with him that makes a difference in our lives. 
He doesn't ask us to stand up and, and, and preach long sermons necessarily. He doesn't necessarily ask us to, um, to, to, to be one of those sidewalk um, preachers. Um, not that there's anything wrong with those, but, but, but the majority of the time when we see people sharing in the Bible, it's as simple as this. Somebody has had an experience with Jesus and they're inviting someone else to come and see the God that made a difference in their life. You know, when I think of, first thing that comes to mind when I think of like an evangelist or of sharing my faith, do, do any of you guys remember the sign guy? He used to put up his van out by Taco Bell and he had a, like signs all over his van that was uh, Jesus is coming or um, you know John 3:16, and he had that little signboard thing, and like, um, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but but primarily what evangelism in the Bible is is simply telling other people the experience that you have had with Jesus. And sometimes that doesn't even take words, right? We can live a life where love comes from us and the way that we interact with people and, and, and others will see as they did with Christ's disciples that this is somebody who has spent time with Jesus and they may wonder where did this, you know, why is this person like this? So in, in with, um, over and over in the language of scripture is an invitation to know Jesus for yourself. Um, in John chapter seven, Jesus says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. I don't know if, have you ever been really, really thirsty? Like, I don't know if it's maybe summertime and you're working hard outside or, or you ran, I got a friend, Drew Maycumber, he's just, just ran a, a 50 mile race. I don't know how he does that, but he's insane. But even if you run like five miles, like you're sweating and you're hot and you're thirsty and like how good does water taste when you're just, you know, like dry throat and speaking of water, man, it just tastes good, doesn't it? But if you have, I don't know, just completely filled your stomach with root beer floats. This happened to me the other night. That's why I said root beer floats. We were selling root beer floats over there, and I don't eat ice cream much, and it doesn't settle well with my stomach, and I don't eat a lot of, uh, of uh, soda either. But, but it was there, and it was going to go flat. And uh, <laughs> anyways... I definitely filled my stomach with ice cream and root beer. And after that, I tried to drink some water and it really didn't, it, it just, it wasn't, it didn't settle well. Like I didn't feel good for a couple of hours. And <sighs> here's the point. When you are thirsty, water is amazing. When you have a need, Jesus is amazing. I think half of the time, probably more than half the time, I just made that statistic up, I think very often, we'll say it that way, I think very often in our society where we have what we need, like you can probably, most of us are not going to go hungry, most of us can stay warm, and most of us don't have a, just a daily need, right, for Jesus. And it's easy to slip by with life going one day after another without feeling that dependence on Him. Are you guys with me? Or am I alone in this? But Jesus invites those who are thirsty to come and drink. And so an experience with Jesus uh, it starts with having a need for him. Uh, I talk all the time to 
to different people, uh, mostly kids, and, and I, I, I share my story and I, I, I talk about uh, uh, how amazing it is to have a, given your heart to Jesus. And, and sometimes I feel like, like they hear me, but they've heard it all the time. And I, and I just wonder if, if they have felt the need. Because when Jesus became real enough to me that it was something I cared about, it was because I, I had a need in my heart that I found that he filled. And so if you haven't yet had that experience with Jesus, what is your need? Have you given it to him? Have you asked him to fill it? And I have found that Jesus fills the longings in my heart, and I know he will do the same for you. Because Jesus promises, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scriptures has said, uh, rivers of living water will flow from within them. I mean, this is, a, this is an interesting picture, right? Somebody has a need. They're thirsty. And once that need is felt with G and filled with Jesus, like, not only are they not thirsty, but they're providing water to the thirsty. And, and, and it's a spring, right? It's a spring of living water. Um, we used to go camping up at uh, 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 Mill Creek. Anybody go up to Mill Creek? Just one of you? There's a spring up at that campground, and it's amazing. It's, it's the freshest, sweetest mountain water. It's super cold. It's great. I love... Uh, that was our favorite thing. We would go drink from the spring. Um, that's very different from like a stagnant swamp, isn't it? We were on a backpacking trip once, and um, we were hiking along a river, so we weren't carrying a lot of water. We just had a water pump. And um, at one point, the river kind of dried up for a bit, and we basically all ran out of water. And we knew it would come back, but it was several hours before we, we got to some water. And the first bit of water was this, like, slimy, black, stagnant pool. And I pumped some of that water, and it was, I mean, I didn't, I didn't get sick, probably because of my pump, but it was just nasty, right? It's not life-giving. Um, it's, 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 blah, describes it well. Um, we are called to be springs of living water, not stagnant swamps. You know what makes water stagnant and swamp-like? It's not flowing anywhere. It's just sitting still. So we try and contain and hold everything in, we become a stagnant swamp. It's like what happens if you uh, spend all your days sitting on the couch, feeding your face, eating lots of things. You might even be eating really good food. But if you don't get off that couch and you just sit there, what happens to you? Somebody said die? <laughs> yeah. You get fat and your muscles deteriorate and you just, any, uh, any power or ability you had in your body, not only does it not grow, but it diminishes and it gets worse and worse, right? But exercise is the thing that strengthens us. And, and, and sharing our faith, serving other people, is that exercise to our spiritual life. Without it, we become sick and fat and impotent Christians. We are called to be living springs of water. And I think it's so cool, like... It's not even like a command, go be a living spring. It's like a cause and effect thing. Like, you are thirsty, you come and drink. And then this one who comes and drinks, he believes, guess what? He becomes. Like, it's just a cause and effect thing. When, when, when I'm excited about birding... Hi, Brock. Looking good. When I'm excited about birding and I'm telling other people about this passion of mine, they get excited about it too. I'm not thinking, okay, i got to make this many birders so that I can, you know, get my people checklist. Um, that was a joke. You can laugh. No, I'm just excited about it. and It's coming out of me. When we have had an experience with Jesus, 
that makes a difference in our heart, it comes out. And I think it's really interesting what, what is coming out. The next verse here tells us that by this he meant that the Holy Spirit, uh, by this he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Um, this living water that is flowing out of us, it's, it's not something that is us, it's, it's the Holy Spirit coming back out of us. We believe in Jesus. We, we, we have an experience with what he does. We have drunk from the spring of life and now we ourselves filled with the Holy Spirit just ooze the presence of Christ to those around us. Make sense? So I still couldn't help but wonder why God would pick sinful, erring uncooperative, unreliant people to be his ambassadors to share this most precious message. I mean, if it seems like an angel could probably do a better job. But maybe it's not just about getting the job done. Something that I have found is that it's vital for my spirituality, for my connection with God, it's vital, it's vital for that, for me to be in place and in a process and in sharing. Probably the, the, the lowest time, the most difficult time for me in um, my relationship with God was when I was a sophomore in college. And, um, you know, when I was in college, I was studying theology, so I'm taking Greek class, I'm taking Hebrew class, I'm studying Revelation, I'm studying, these are my classes at the time. I've got an Old Testament class, I had a New Testament class. Um, I, think I, I think I even had a class on Christian spirituality that quarter, uh, semester. But then why did it seem harder and harder to connect with God. It was getting harder and harder to wake up and do my devotions and, and it was becoming more of a do my devotions instead of having my devotions and, and, and I would try and pray but you know I just was like uh, work. And I didn't really figure it out until later. I took the next year off and I went to Arise. And Arise is a, a, is a school of evangelism up in Oregon and um, it's all about sharing. Like there are classes, tons of them, but there's also an insane amount of service and sharing. And it was looking back on that that I realized that what was missing in my life in my sophomore year of college was service. I wasn't sharing with anybody. I was studying the Bible for my classes. I was trying to study the Bible for myself. I was wondering why I'm feeling so spiritually dead and all of this inward focus is just taking me down and down and down. I was like a, like a, like a fat Christian stagnant swamp. Swamp Christian. And the revitalization of my spiritual life came when I started serving and sharing with other people. I would submit to you that God gave us this task because we need it. Nothing draws us closer to God like serving and sharing what He has done. Because when I'm sharing with other people, I'm praying for them. And I'm out of my comfort zone. And so I'm, I'm praying for God to give me the words. And I've got something tangible that I'm praying about. And I, I'm focused on something outside of myself. And when I'm studying the word, it's life to my soul because I need it. And you hear that from all, all over the place. Those who are in the most need are the ones that find that Christ is the nearest. And when we're putting ourselves in a place of sharing we're putting ourselves in a place of dependence on him and need. I 
I, I, I heard somebody do an amazing job of this this week. I was at Troy's um, coffee shop, Union Hill, right? And I was uh, working on my sermon there, and I wasn't trying to be an eavesdropper, but I was just sitting there working on my computer, had my headphones in, and I couldn't help but hear part of this conversation that was happening next to me. It was amazing. A member from our church was talking with her friend, and I don't know what, they talked about who knows what. It was a long conversation, but just one part of it, I, I, I heard a bit of it, and she was sharing how she had experienced the power of the gospel through a message that was preached here by Nathan a couple of years ago. And she was just sharing how this was so meaningful to her life, how, what a difference it made in her outlook. And um, she was just telling her friend about her experience with Jesus. And then she's like, I just have been so blessed by the direction that this church is going. And, you know, if you'd like to go, we've got services at 9.30 and 11. And I thought, this is amazing. This is exactly what Andrew was doing. This is exactly uh, what John the Baptist was doing. This is exactly what, what, uh, what is done over and over and over in the Bible. Somebody has had an experience with Jesus, and they're just telling their friends what Jesus has done in their life. Amen? So, so what is your story? I mean, I don't really have a story. Like, I didn't start selling drugs at nine, and I didn't kill a man when I was 14, and I didn't go to prison for a hundred years, and meet Jesus there, so I don't have a story, and I'm not making fun of those stories, by the way, because those are powerful, amazing stories of deliverance, but I don't know if you're with me, have you ever felt like I don't really have a story, because I grew up in a Christian home, and I went to a Christian school and a Christian church, and I'm still a Christian, has anybody felt like that? Okay. But you know, your story is your story with Jesus. And it could be as simple as I have found in Jesus a friend that satisfies the longings of my heart. It, it could be something like this. Um, I can't really explain it, but after I poured my heart out to God and, and I told him that if he doesn't do something, I'm gonna go crazy. Um, that all of a sudden, like, I was just filled with this peace and this issue that was driving me crazy. I can't explain it, but I, uh, he took care of it. Or, or, or maybe, maybe, maybe your, your story is um, that there um, was something that the pastor said that just, just clicked. And I realize that I'm saved because Jesus loves me and gave himself for me. It's not something I have to earn. And now I'm free. I'm free to love and to, to, to be me. I don't have to worry that I'm enough. Maybe that's your story. Maybe, maybe, it, was, um, maybe it was, man, I was just having a week that was kicking my butt. Um, work was hard. There was stress at home with my family. And I was reading Psalms 23. And um, I just, I mean, I, I read that, that God was my shepherd and I shall not want. And honestly, I was a little bit angry because, like, and I just started telling him, Lord, you say that I won't want, but look, I'm wanting in here and here and here and here and here. And, 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 and as I kept reading, I read that he restores my soul. And so I said, okay, God, this is what, who you say you are. And I, and I told him, uh, uh, 
that these are now his problems and I, and I left them there for him to deal with and, and, and nothing changed in my circumstances but, but, uh, but uh, um, you know, I'm not a super emotional person and I can't explain it but I felt like some tears in my eyes as I just felt free from the burden of these, these wants knowing that this God was going to take care of it and he did. Maybe that's your story. Everybody has a story. If you have a want and you have given it to Jesus, you have a story. Maybe your story is that you are struggling with pornography and no matter how many times you tried to put it down, you kept picking it back up and you'd pray about it and uh, you'd recite Bible verses and it just wasn't working. And uh, until one day you just said, all right, I'm going to stop fighting I'm not going to fight this with fire, but, but rather when I feel the, the, the temptation even just starting to, to creep into my mind, I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to start talking to God about who He is and I'm going to just start praying, Jesus, thank you that you are the God who comes and saves. Thank you that you are the God who delivers. And I'm going to just talk to Jesus about who He is and what He has done for my life until those thoughts have scattered. And now it's been six months since I've fallen. Maybe that's your story. Everybody has a story. Because Jesus is the Savior of each person. And so we are called into relationship with Him to come and drink from this fountain when we are thirsty. And when we have drunk from this fountain, the natural response is that these rivers of water now flow from us to other people to bring them to the fountain as well. Does this make sense? Does that sound simple? Is this, raise your hand if this is something that you think you could do. I could share my story with someone else. Amen. So today, my next step, where do we go from here? Maybe you have not had an experience with Jesus yet. Maybe you don't know him. My next step is to ask Jesus for an experience with him. So the next time I am wanting, I will know I can turn to this fountain. My next step is to pray that Jesus will show me who he is. Or... My next step is to talk about what Jesus has done for me. So you can get your um, connect card out of the pew in front of you. There's a place on the back that says, my next step is. It's my next step is. And you can write your next step there. My next step is to ask Jesus for an experience with him. My next step is to talk about what Jesus has done for me. Okay, the deacons are going to come forward and they're going to collect your offering and they'll also collect your connect cards. You can, it's a place on the card for prayer requests if you'd like. Um, if, you don't, if you'd like to, you can, you can give your offering online by texting DLSCA to the phone number up on the screen.
they are yours. Lord, help us to have an experience with you that is meaningful and life-changing. And Lord, let us have opportunities to just tell others what you have done in our life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.